Before I begin, I just want to say that Mary basically gave me one of those blanks in Scrabble. She said I could pick any DS9 episode I wanted. And like the blank, I held it longer than I probably should have, waiting for just the right time to use it. So I appreciate her patience as I finally use it here, for things past. Because the thing about Necessary Evil was that watching it for the review two weeks ago immediately made me want to watch this one. And that's why we're here. It's not a perfect follow-up, but it's a natural one, an essential one. It's the other shoe dropping to remind us that few are going to emerge from the occupation untarnished, no matter what we might think of ourselves. The subject of the occupation is brought up now, in this Season 5 episode, because Sisko, Dax, Garrick, and Odo are returning from a conference discussing that on Bajor, where it seems that Garrick's discussion of the pros of it didn't go over so well. I thought the Bajorans bent over backwards to be polite to you, Garrick. Giving me a name tag that read Elim Garrick, former Cardassian oppressor, was hardly polite. That is a bit of a dick move, yeah. Unless you think he was being metaphorical. And what did you want it to say? Former spy? Her choice of words in her tone suggests that he wasn't making some kind of sarcastic remark and she's building upon that. It sounds like it's literally what it said and she's saying, well, would you have preferred something else instead? If it is literally what happened, it's a pretty pointlessly rude. It's not as if Garrick was himself oppressing anybody. The only stories we have of his involvement in the occupation are three stories that are completely inconsistent and being told by a known liar in the midst of his own drug withdrawal. Otherwise, he's just the guy who ran the tailor shop. If you're wondering why Garrick's even here, the purpose of the conference was supposed to be a dispassionate analysis of the occupation from a purely historical perspective. And Garrick was there to apparently offer some positive notes about the occupation. Now, it goes without saying that the occupation was brutal, but it is theoretically possible that Garrick might have had some valid points. I don't know what they are, and I'm not saying that they were. I'm not even going to speculate on what they are, because I don't feel like shooting myself in the head. However, the point of looking at the occupation, not with romanticism, but a dispassionate analysis of true history, means that when we look at it, we see that Nobody, not even the good guys, emerged squeaky clean from that. Everybody did something ugly. That's one of the main themes of the episode. Don't get mad at me, I just work here. Hey! Riot! This quickly segues to Odo, who is brooding. Um, let me clarify, he's brooding more than usual, despite having been quite popular at the conference and praised by Sisko and Dax for his ability to earn trust from both sides through his fairness. But that seems to do little to lift his spirits. Something's clearly bothering him. And not just the fact that during early Season 5, Odo was living as a solid because of his people's judgment. Back in Necessary Evil, he had mentioned his racial characteristic, a sense of justice, that was his connection to them. Since then, that viewpoint has been shattered by discovering them and learning that it was not a desire for justice, but order. A stark difference since the Dominion was ordered but full of injustice. Next thing we know, the station is picking up the returning runabout coming in on autopilot, and the foursome unconscious and growing weaker. It doesn't explain why they wake up lying against a wall on Tirak Nord during the days of the occupation. That's a symptom that you won't normally find on WebMD. Usually it's just a complication of athlete's foot. They're dragged to their feet by a passing Bajoran who's pissed off to see them looking like street junkies there, because that only reinforces the Cardassians' view that they are inferior. Before we can wrap our heads around that, we're in sickbay, where Bashir informs us that the four of them are unconscious. That's what a degree from medical school gets you. Now, the odd thing is that their minds are very active despite that. Thus, we quickly learn that they're not actually in the past, which might seem like a poor choice since this removes the mystery aspect of it, but I'm going to buck conventional thinking on this episode and say this was the right move. The mystery should not be about what's happened to place them on Terak Nor. The mystery should be why they are experiencing what they are. The former could easily overshadow the latter if it wasn't quickly established that this is neither time travel nor a holodeck at work. As they themselves note while puzzling it out, there is no explanation for them being seen as Bajorans by everyone else but their normal selves to each other, excluding Quantum Leap, of course. 
From this, we can quickly piece together that whatever weird thing is going on, this is in their heads, not reality. Odo's collision with a walking dead man is proof enough of that. That booze is not doing Tony Stark any favors. And if that's not bad enough, Gold Ducat has taken notice of their quartet, and by his side is Odo's predecessor, Thrax. At this time in the show, Ducat was fighting the noble battle against the aggressive Klingons, so basically he was now a good guy. But that doesn't change the fact that in any era, Ducat had a sexual appetite that'd make Hugh Hefner blush, so he sends guards over to bring him Jadzia. Garrick tries to bribe the guard into letting her go, but with Ducat right there, watching everything, it's probably not the best time to accept a bribe. Even if you're the kind of person who masturbates at work, you at least have the common sense not to do it in your cubicle while your boss is standing right there. The important thing to come out of that, though, is that when the guard bashes Garrick in the face, the real Garrick bleeds, and Monsieur figures that if any of them think that they'll die, then the same psychosomatic response might kill them. So we got that going for us. One good thing that came from that beating was it gave Garrick the chance to lift the Cardassian's comp link, which they used to find out who they are supposed to be. Only Odo already knows his name, and not because it's written on his underwear. Before Sisko can get him to explain how the hell he could know that, Quark stops by offering them work, and since they're nearly slaves, it fits that they'll work for nearly a slave's wage for him. I should probably note, though, since this is not time travel, Everything with Ducat and Quark that we see is not actually them in action. So while I don't doubt that Quark took advantage of the situation, we also know that he was sympathetic to the Bajorans, selling essentials to them at just above cost, which, you know, for a Ferengi is the same as just giving something away. So how much of this is him and how much is being projected by the opinion of him by the controlling force of this place is debatable. Meanwhile, Jadzia has been delivered to Ducat, although he seems intent on charming his way into her pants rather than forcing his way in. And the fact that he plucked her off the street corner against her will does nothing to change that view in his mind, because, as we've seen, real or not, Ducat seems to rewrite reality in his head. I'm isolated from the people who live under my protection. I require someone to talk with. In short, a friend. Ah, and making them twirl about to show off the goods is your first step in making friends. This explains everything we need to know about how you handle Bajor. Seriously, it does. Now again, this isn't the real Ducat, but this is fully consistent with the disconnect that he possesses. She's here to be taken advantage of, but in his mind, she secretly yearns for it, and he just needs to get her to recognize that. The same with the Bajorans. They're stripping the planet of everything. But in his mind, the people should be grateful they have such a fair man in charge. Perplexing that they keep wanting to kill him, huh? Speaking of which, that's how Odo explains how he knew the names. The three people they are were accused of trying to assassinate Dukat. And it seems they were probably the only three people who don't want to do that. But despite being innocent, Dukat had them executed as an example. If you're going to kill him, do it properly or don't do it at all. Now... Think about what you did. Quark gets a visit from Thrax. Is it just me or is that name kind of metal for a Cardassian? I could totally picture him with an electric guitar in some garage somewhere. It's some of the expected banter that you get between Quark and Odo, except that it's Thrax there instead. Funny thing is, the person they discussed didn't arrive in this area until seven years ago. In fact, backed up by the date on the comp link. Only that should mean that Odo has recently gone from handling that murder case to becoming chief of security, and Thrax long gone. Off banging some groupie, no doubt, before a life of hard rock and hard drugs catches up with him. Sisko figures their only choice is to try to get off the station, but they're going to need help from the resistance to do that. Luckily, he knows the secret summoning technique, so they turn the vase over, grab their soup, and wait. And all while Ducat struts about with Dax in tow to show off to his new friend what a man of the people he is. <laughs> oh yeah, I should have told you, that bowl is very hot. The contact finally shows up. It's the guy from the beginning who told them to stop sleeping sprawled out in their own vomit. Nevertheless, he's open to discussion. They know the secret signal and all of that. But there's no time. 
that assassination attempt happens, injuring Dax, so Sisko naturally rushes to help her. And the last thing you want to do in the area of guards who failed to stop an assassination attempt is stand out in any way. They're looking to make up for looking like they just screwed up royally. For instance, how about this guy who thought he was in a movie and thus could interrupt President Reagan's speech with his own? As you can see, security made sure to make up for laying that guy on the stage. Though in his defense, I believe he was mistakenly trying to accept an award for best cosplay of Jim Henson. Anyway, they're locked up and soon Thrax comes by to lay out the facts. While Odo finally seems to speak up, challenging every assertion Thrax makes about their guilt. The chemicals on their bodies match those of the bomb, but also the cleaning material that they used at Quark's. Several of them have ties to the resistance through family or friends, but that's true of most Bajorans. The guard who arrested them said Sisko was trying to strangle Dukat, but Odo doesn't even need to point out that anyone who failed to save Dukat wouldn't want to follow it up by arresting the wrong person, so they'll say anything to prove they've, they've redeemed themselves. Meanwhile, Dukat is droning on to Dax about how noble his leadership is. My weakness is I'm too generous, too forgiving. And of course, the pelvic pains caused by the weight of my enormous penis. As you can see, Jadzia knocks him out and then breaks the trio out of their cell, but they don't get far before Thrax and his deputies catch up. And during the fight, Thrax escapes by shapeshifting into an air duct. I mean, he shapeshifted and climbed into one. He didn't turn into an air duct. I don't think that would have fooled anybody. This is replaced with a whole new pile of weird when they make it to the escape shuttle, only to wind up back in the cell. And with the hole fixed, damn it. The Cardassians have many faults, but they always make sure the repairs ran on schedule. Naturally, the other three note how everything seems to lead back to Odo, who's even more agitated than ever, and not just because of their execution in two hours. But there's one last chance when Thrax agrees to talk to Odo, but he remains unconvinced. Since the evidence in this case is sufficient to warrant conviction, the investigation is over. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Your job is to find the truth, not obtain convictions. Truth. You want the truth. You're a dumbass. That's the truth. Thrax turns the subject to the occupation and how the Bajoran resistance causes a lot of these problems and opposes the rule of law. There is more to life than the rule of law. It has been my observation that only the guilty make that kind of statement. By now it should be obvious what's really going on with Thrax and the realization that Odo is, in fact, arguing with himself, the person he was who cared more about order in this case than about justice. They're immediately dropped into the execution, Garrick, Dax, and Sisko ready to be gunned down and the only way to stop it is for Odo to finally admit it, that it was him. Three days from now, there will be another identical bombing, and Odo will discover his mistake. We saw how overcrowded the holding cells were, part of the reason that this happened, how Odo was so busy that he didn't give it the investigation that it demanded. With that finished, they all come out of it. It seems the tech-tech field they ran into triggered the lingering changeling parts of him and tried to form a link with the others. And since the only others there were solids, they sort of joined into a link telepathic experience. Yeah, a bit silly even for Star Trek, but there it is. Plus it foreshadows his eventual return to shapeshifting. The episode closes, as with Necessary Evil, with Kira and Odo discussing the past. Only this time it's Kira who's disappointed with him over what happened. Though part of that was because they held him in such high esteem that this failure of his seems all the more damning. Post-episode follow-up, annoying character goes to the Bajoran techs in ops. Not sure why, but something about the way she talked was distracting. Final score for Things Past is 8 out of 10. It's not up to necessary evil, but it's still a great story. It's Odo's version of Tapestry, the moment early in his career when he made a mistake, the one that he regrets more than anything. The choice of Thrax was likely not just so as not to see himself there, but also that when he looks at the Odo who was security chief at this time, he sees a Cardassian, 
more concerned with order and the rule of law than with justice. Despite what the Bajorans said, he was one of them, one of the oppressors. Yet like Tapestry, this is probably the moment that changed the way that he did things, made him become the man the Bajorans respected, even though in his heart he felt he didn't deserve it for what he did. He had said in Necessary Evil that no one had to teach him the justice trick. But here we learn that these three men did. Their death taught Odo the difference between order and justice, and created that which set him apart from his people. Three dead solids would never bother the founders, whereas for Odo, it forever changed his life. to suffer a mysterious accident. I'm not sure, but maybe we should conduct a little experiment and find out. 